Welcome back to Low Carbon Lifestyle. As I uploaded the last video, I kind of thought to myself, is that it? Haven't you got anything else to say? And I thought maybe that's the end. Maybe that's the end of Low Carbon Lifestyle. <coughs> but no, there's so much still to do and there's so much carbon to still get rid of. So I thought I'd have a little think about one of the parts of my life that emits more CO2 than others. And that's my heating system, which we don't necessarily need to use much at the moment, but um, we're gonna look into one of the solutions that hopefully we'll all become familiar with over the next few years, um, and that is heat pumps. What are they? How do they work? Are they low carbon? Are they expensive to buy? Are they expensive to run? Should I get one? Let's have a little look at heat pumps in low carbon lifestyle. And this is a little series about a low carbon lifestyle. Sometimes this whole sustainable living can feel well, well intimidating, whether it's thinking you need to buy an electric car or install solar panels on your roof. The majority of us can't do that overnight. We can't do that straight away. Or it looks like completely changing the way you live, living off the land or turning vegan overnight, both of which are fantastic things. But for this mini series, we're gonna talk through how each of us can lower our emissions in everyday life and what that might look like. Welcome back to Low Carbon Lifestyle. Over the next two episodes, we're gonna take on one of the big issues in reducing emissions at the buildings in the UK. And that is the issue of heat. Where I live in County Durham, we tend to get fairly cold winters. And actually across the whole UK, the story is the same. I'm sure you've experienced it. The average temperature over the whole year in Durham is actually about nine degrees centigrade. So for a lot of the year, in the leaky homes that we live in, we need some heating to be comfortable. And when the temperature's a bit higher, we still need some heating for showers or baths and for cooking. How do we do that heating? For the majority of us in the UK, around 25 million homes, this requ requirement for heating means we've got natural gas-fired boilers. And they heat um, water in central heating systems to provide heat to radiators, to provide hot water to hot water tanks, or just directly to our taps. And we love it, we absolutely love it. We have really comfortable homes at quite a low cost, and we tend to be able to rely on natural gas boilers to keep us warm and washed all year round. But what's the impact of burning a fossil fuel in your home on your emissions? In episode one of this series, I talked about counting where our emissions come from. And when I did that exercise, I was amazed at the proportion of emissions linked to my gas usage. Over the last year, our home has emitted on average 230 kilograms of CO2 per month just by burning gas in our boiler and on our hub. Over the winter, this was around 400 kilograms of CO2 each month. And that's about 10 times the quantity of emissions linked to our electricity use. Little aside, we do actually have a zero carbon electricity supply, but the whole grid that the electrons come from is still emitting CO2. So I count the dirty version. So how do I begin at removing the emissions linked to our gas use and to our heating? Well, there are loads of solutions, including simply turning our heating down a little bit, um, reducing the amount of time that we heat things, stopping drafts, adding insulation where we can, allowing sunlight in when it shines, and lots more. But one of the more active solutions to reduce our emissions linked to heating is a bit more drastic, and it involves ripping out our boilers um, and installing what we call a heat pump. Now, a heat pump is a technology that we, we all basically use every single day in our fridges, but it's a technology that isn't used much for heating, at least in the UK. So what is a heat pump and how does it work? Here's a little bit of engineering thermodynamics for you. A heat pump basically acts like a fridge. It moves heat from one place to another. It takes a heat source, whether it's the air, the ground or water, and it uses that heat source to heat up and evaporate a fluid. That evaporation makes a gas. The heat pump then compresses that gas using a bit of magic, which we call electricity, in what we call an, a compressor. And this part of the system adds heat or energy to that gas. The heat pump then condenses the gas to form a liquid and that cond condensing process releases energy or heat to what we call a heat sink. 
which in our case would be a water tank or a room or radiators, that kind of thing. And finally, that heat pump expands the fluid, allowing the pressure to drop and ending the process by returning to a heat source to start again. At that compression stage in the middle, we use a little bit of energy to help heat the fluid up, but that's basically it. And that cycle can be used to, to provide heat to a home. And it's really efficient. For every unit of electricity that we use, we tend to get at least two, if not two and a half units of heat. It's at least 200% efficient. But what about CO2? This whole thing's about CO2, isn't it? Is a heat pump any good for reducing our emissions? Surely there are still emissions linked to using electricity. Surely a heat pump just uses loads of electricity. Well, let's do the maths. As I mentioned earlier, a large amount of my emissions is linked to heating in my home. So that's heating radiators, heating water, and heating food. And most of that's done by my gas boiler. For every unit of heat we get from a gas boiler, we tend to assume that emissions will be around 180 <laughs> to 200 grams of CO2. What's the equivalent for a heat pump? Well, a heat pump uses electricity, and for every unit of electricity, um, that emits about 250 grams of CO2. It's less on a windy, sunny day, and more when it's cloudy, cold, and still, but assume 250. With a heat pump, if we assume we get a unit of heat for half a unit of electricity, each unit of heat will actually emit 125 grams of CO2, and that's at least 30% less than a gas boiler. If I'm being really honest here, I've been quite conservative on a few things. First of all, on the heat pump efficiency, it could sometimes be more than two. The carbon intensity of the grid, it should be less than 250 grams. And actually the carbon content of a unit of heat from, natural, from a natural gas boiler. And really a heat pump could provide heat at half the emissions of a gas boiler. And as we continue to decarbonize the electricity grid with more wind turbines and solar panels, the emissions of, the heat, of a heat pump would keep dropping. Up until uh, last year, I worked uh, as an engineer in low carbon building design. I was really fortunate to work on this absolute banger of a building back in 2014. This is one of the physics buildings at Durham University. And I was part of the team designing the heating, cooling, ventilation, and actually low carbon energy for, for this. I did all the energy modeling for it, which was quite a task. But what makes this building so special other than the funky shapes? Well, it's pretty low carbon. It's really well insulated. It's got over 100 meters squared of solar panels on the roof. And under there, it's got about seven boreholes that are used to extract heat in a ground source heat pump. It's pumping fluid around in a closed loop, taking heat out of the ground and delivering it to radiators within the building. As well as that, this building is so well insulated that actually the heat load for it will be similar to your or my home. It's really low. And because of that low demand and because of the ground source heat pump, um, we are able to provide really, really low carbon heat to the building. And this building was able to be part of the university's master plan for a sustainable future. I love it. It looks pretty cool. So what's the conclusion? We should all get heat pumps, right? Well, maybe. Although heat pumps can provide heat to a building, they're not without their limitations, as everything. First of all, when it's really cold outside, a cold winter's night, a Christmas night, if you will. The efficiency of the heat pump drops significantly. So from two to two and a half and closer to one. And that means the emissions are actually really quite close to a gas boiler. Second, heat pumps work most efficiently when heating to quite low water temperatures. Our boilers tend to heat water to above 60 degrees C, which means they can distribute water and heat really well to our, our radiators. On the other hand, heat pumps, they work best heating up water to 45, at most 50 degrees C. And this reduces the effectiveness of a radiator and actually may mean that in order to make a heat pump work in your home, you'd need to increase the size of your radiators or use underfloor heating. Both of those things could be quite disruptive to a home that's been lived in for a while. The third limitation is, when it, uh, is really when it comes to hot water. Heating up to a level that we're used to and a safe level that would prevent bacteria like Legionella from forming, we tend to aim for 60 degrees C. And at this temperature, the efficiency of a heat pump can be down at one and a half. So on a cold winter's night, heating up hot water, it could be really low. Hey, next day Tom here. We kind of use electric water heaters all the time, whether it's like those water boilers we get in like community centers and churches or kettles 
or actually electric showers. So a heat pump will, will be better than them. So I'm not sure what point I'm really making here. The fourth limitation is that there's a worry that our electricity grids really aren't meaty enough to take on all the heat, ro heat loads of our current leaky buildings on the coldest day of the year, as well as charging up our cars. To be honest, at the moment, the electricity grid couldn't do it. It couldn't provide that much heat. But we aren't all installing our heat pumps tomorrow and we have time to change and bolster it. But as I keep on saying, we need to reduce the demand for energy in our buildings and in our transport first. And if we reduce the demand, then the electricity grid has, has some kind of chance of coping. The fifth limitation of heat pumps is cost. At the moment, the standard rate for electricity is around 15 pence per kilowatt hour. For gas, it's around three pence per kilowatt hour. That's a big difference. Even with a heat pump operating at, at, at an efficiency of three, and it could do that, the cost for a unit of heat using a heat pump will always be, or will currently be, at least two pence higher than a gas boiler. There is a heat pump subsidy at the moment. It's actually currently under consultation from the government, but at the moment you get just over 10 pence per unit of heat an airless heat pump produces. And that's from a government scheme called the Renewable Heat Incentive. This should offset the cost of an installation, which is significant, and it may help make a bit of money back over the cheaper heating by gas. It is time limited to seven years for domestic properties, and it hasn't really actually encouraged that many people to take the plunge for the heat pumps. But finally on cost, um, natural gas is actually really cheap at the moment. It's priced really, really low. It can't stay that low forever. If natural gas prices rose, and that didn't impact the, the cost of electricity too much, or a big assumption, a heat pump could actually start to get cost competitive, particularly if we start to charge the true carbon cost of our gas supply. So in summary, heat pumps are limited. They may, may cost more to run, they may not provide as high quality heat as a gas boiler, and they may need some significant changes in our homes as a result. As with many low carbon solutions, there may need to be significant change in how we do things in order to meaningfully reduce our emissions. The reality is, and these are similar conclusions to those from the fourth episode in this series on electric vehicles, we really need to reduce the heat demand, first of all, through increasing energy efficiency, insulating our homes properly, reducing drafts and heating more efficiently. These are what we call no regret changes and can help reduce the, the, the demand for heat in the first place. We should insulate, insulate, insulate first. Layers and layers of stuff. Better windows and doors, maybe even whole house ventilation units with heat recovery. And then when we've done that, if there's any need for heating left, which there might not be, we could then consider heat pumps. And when we're in that place with really low energy buildings, we start to get this dream of low carbon, low energy living in a nice, cozy house. Solar panels on a roof, powering a heat pump for heating and hot water. Solar panels charging an electric bike and filling a battery for when it isn't that sunny. The low carbon, electrified vision tends to work pretty well. I should say um, that off, as often with interesting technological solutions, there can be more than one solution to the problem. Heat pumps aren't everything. And the HD DVD meets Blu-ray, Betamax versus VHS, etc. of the heating world involves hydrogen. And there are several companies, including Worcester Bosch, where a, a mate of mine is leading the, on the heat decarbonisation story. There are several companies working on hydrogen-ready boilers. Hydrogen as an energy vector can provide similar amounts of energy to a building as natural gas and can provide that energy in a similar network of pipes. Even today, in trials not too far away from here in the northeast in Bladen, there is in the gas network, there's 20% by volume of gas in the pipes will be hydrogen rather than methane. This needs a whole nother video to talk about. Um, and it's quite exciting, but that'll be episode eight. So in conclusion, should you buy an air source heat pump and install it in your home? Well, first of all, reduce your demand, upgrade your insulation, then depending on what happens with, with the renewable heat incentive consultation that's on now, yeah, by all means, get a quote to install an SOS heat pump. This could be a really good next step in reducing the emissions linked to your home. And actually, one of the things that government policy is going to say 
is that there shouldn't be a gas boiler for heating in homes from 2025. And that means if you buy a brand new home in 2025, you may start with a heat pump straight away. It's not something to be scared of. It will provide you heat in a similar way to a gas boiler and it will be a really low carbon way of doing it. But shouldn't we just wait for hydrogen? Well, first of all, wait for the second, this next episode. But briefly, I'm of the conclusion that we need to take drastic steps now with the opportunities that we have. Waiting for something else to solve the problem just makes the problems worse. Yes, there may be a fully functional, low carbon hydrogen gas grid in 15 years time, but that means 15 years of high emissions waiting for something to happen. That actually may not get there in the end. I heard the chief executive of Scottish Power, a guy called Keith Anderson, uh, talk in a webinar a couple of weeks ago. And he said, at the moment, the solution is to electrify, electrify, electrify. So if you have an efficient house with an old boiler that's about to come to the end of its life, I would definitely consider an air source heat pump. I'll put some links below to some good thinkers about heat pumps and people who are making that uh, electrification journey today. For me, heat pumps are part of this decarbonisation story. They're not the whole story, but they're certainly a step in reducing the emissions linked to heating in the UK. There might be a half step there, uh, and there are products that have hybrid heat pumps where it will use a, a gas boiler when a heat pump's not working efficiently, and it will use a heat pump when it's really efficient and cheap. That might be a solution as well, although part of my worry is that it just doubles up everything that we have more complication, more cost. The house that I live in, um, when we moved in, it had a gas boiler fitted about a year before. That gas boiler's probably got about another eight, nine, 10 years of life. Um, I'm not gonna put a heat pump in anytime soon, but if we're still living here in 10 years, which we may be, um, then I would definitely consider looking at a heat pump market then, or whatever else exists in 2030. Who knows? Okay, that's it for episode seven. A, a short summary about heat pumps. Thanks again for watching. If you wanna stay in touch, please like this video, subscribe to this channel, maybe even sign up to the mailing list link below and finally follow me on Twitter. Thanks so much um, for being interested in a low carbon lifestyle and see you next time for episode eight on hydrogen. Like and subscribe. <laughs>